Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good I have just a couple things at the top, uh, and then we'll, we'll get going. So tomorrow, as you all know, the president is going to be traveling to Baltimore, where he will receive an operational update on response efforts from the Unified Command. Leaders from the Coast Guard and, Army, and the Army Corps of Engineers will share updates on the assistance they are providing to state officials in serving and removing the wreckage in the channel and allowing the port of Baltimore to reopen as soon as humanly possible. The president will be joined by Governor Moore and other Maryland and Baltimore area elected officials. He'll also be joined by Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. As we all know, six individuals tragically lost their lives when the Francis Scott King Bridge collapsed last week. They were hard workers laboring in the middle of the night to repair potholes on a bridge that tens of thousands of travelers crossed every day. The president will meet with loved ones of those individuals during his trip tomorrow. The president is continuing to lead a whole of government approach in responding to the bridge collapse. As the president said, within hours of the collapse, this administration will be with the people of Baltimore every step of the way. SBA Administrator Guzman is in Baltimore today as part of this administration's efforts to support small businesses in need. I also want to share a very big announcement that the Vice President uh, and the EPA Administrator Reagan made today in Charlotte, North Carolina. They announced a $20 billion, uh, $20, $20 billion in awards to expand access to clean energy, tackle the climate crisis, improve air quality, lower energy costs, and create good paying jobs. This investment through the EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund will stand up a national network that will finance tens of thousands of climate and clean energy projects across America. At least 70% of these funds will be invested in low-income and disadvantaged communities. This makes the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund the single largest non-tax investment in the Inflation Reduction Act to build a clean energy economy while benefiting communities that have historically been left behind. And finally, 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 I want to briefly preview the President's schedule next week. On Monday, we'll, he will travel to Madison, Wisconsin, and discuss how he is lowering costs for Americans. Later in the week, the President and the First Lady will host the Prime Minister of Japan and his wife for an official visit to the United States. This will include a state dinner on Wednesday, April 10th. The visit will underscore the enduring strength of our alliance, the unwavering U.S. commitment to Japan, and Japan's increasing global leadership role. On Thursday, April 11th, President Biden will host Prime Minister Marcos of the Philippines, Prime Minister Kushida of Japan at the White House for the first trilateral U.S. Japan Philippines Leaders Summit. In addition, President Biden will host President Marcos for a meeting at the White House on April 11th to review the historic momentum in the U.S. Philippines relations. Thank you for your patience. With that, the Admiral is here to talk about the President's call with Prime Minister Netanyahu and any updates that we have in the Middle East. Admiral? Good afternoon, everybody. Obviously a busy day here. I do want to take a moment just at the start to recognize the 75th anniversary of the NATO alliance, greatest military alliance in the history of the world. And you all saw the statement from the president earlier today uh, celebrating this historic milestone. Now, for 75 years, the NATO alliance has stood together for freedom and against aggression, provided an unrivaled bulwark of security that has helped protect the American people. And during that time, our NATO allies have come to our aid in our time of need with NATO forces serving alongside ours in Afghanistan. Today, NATO is larger, stronger, it's more relevant than ever before, thanks in no small part to the President's leadership. We look forward to building on all that progress in July when we host our 31 NATO allies here in Washington, D.C. for the next NATO summit. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, the President had a chance to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu earlier uh, today. On that phone call, the President emphasized that the strikes on humanitarian workers and the overall humanitarian situation in Gaza are unacceptable. He made clear the need for Israel to announce and to implement a series of specific, concrete, and measurable steps to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. He made clear that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action on these steps. 
He underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential to stabilize and improve the humanitarian situation and to protect innocent civilians. And he urged the prime minister to empower his negotiators to conclude a deal without delay to bring the hostages home. The two leaders also discussed public Iranian threats against Israel and the Israeli people. President Biden made clear that the United States strongly supports Israel in the face of those threats. That's all I have. Uh, thanks, uh, John. Uh, first, uh, off on that last piece there, you said uh, you have said it from this podium several times that the, the Hamas was the obstacle to getting some sort of ceasefire deal, calling on the Israelis to empower the negotiators, suggested that has changed as the U.S. assessment of Israeli willingness to reach a ceasefire deal uh, changed in the last several weeks? No, it, look, it takes, it takes active participation and the negotiation of both sides here. Um, and, uh, and that's what the president is urging. He's certainly in the call with Netanyahu, urging that, uh, that the prime minister uh, empower his team uh, to the maximum extent possible to see if we can get this deal in place. And then just on uh, the substance of uh, the real news from the president's statement there, uh, saying that he's going to condition future U.S. support for, this, uh, for Israeli, uh, the Israeli operations in Gaza um, on what Israel does. First off, what is at stake? What would be potentially cut off uh, from Israel for use in this war if, uh, if it doesn't change course? And second, what do you want specifically to see from Israel or to do to protect civilians and humanitarian aid workers? I'm not going to preview um, uh, any potential policy decisions coming forward. Um, uh, what we want to see are some real changes uh, on the Israeli side. Um, and, um, you know, if we don't see changes from their side, they'll have to be changes from our side. But I won't preview what that could look like. Now, they talked about uh, – I'm sorry. Is that just the body count, or is there a specific uh, change? Again, I'm, I'm, as, in terms of – concrete steps, uh, what we are uh, looking to see and, and hope to see here uh, in coming hours and days is uh, a dramatic increase in the humanitarian assistance getting in, additional crossings opened up, uh, and a, um, a reduction in the violence against uh, civilians and certainly aid workers. We want to uh, see that, uh, that uh, even as the Israelis work through their investigation, that they are willing and able to take practical immediate steps to protect aid workers on the ground and to demonstrate uh, that they that they have that civilian harm mitigation in place. So again, those are broad brushes. I'll let the Israelis speak to what they will or won't do here. But again, in coming hours and days, we will be looking for concrete, tangible steps that they're taking. Okay. Thanks, uh, John. Just to go back to that point, in your readout, when you say the president made clear that the U.S that U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action. Could you decode that for us? What exactly is the warning that's being issued here? I think it's very clear in the language itself, uh, Nancy. Um, we're going to – the we're looking for concrete steps to alleviate humanitarian suffering in Gaza. Again, I won't get ahead of what the Israelis will or won't say or announce. We're looking for concrete steps to be announced here soon. Um, and it's not just about the announcement of concrete steps and changes in their policies, but it's the ep execution of those announcements and those decisions and implementing them. Uh, and so we're, we obviously will will watch closely and monitor uh, how how they do on, on the commitments that they make. And as um, as I said earlier, if there's no changes to their policy and their approaches, then there's going to have to be changes to ours. I think I think what the world wants to understand is. Is the White House warning that it may remove military aid? What exactly is the threat here? I think I've I've uh, stated it pretty clearly, uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to, as I said earlier, I'm not going to preview steps. I'm not going to preview decisions that haven't been made yet. But um, there are things that need to be done. There are too many civilians being killed. The risk to aid workers is unacceptable. Uh, now we have certain aid organizations that are reconsidering whether they're even going to be able to continue operations in Gaza while famine looms. So there has to be tangible steps. Let's see what they announce. Let's see what they direct. Let's see what they do. Uh, but I'm not going to get ahead of that. I'm going to try this one more time because the president. I reckon you would. <laughs> That's what we do. The president seems to have said to, to the prime minister today, you know, make these concrete changes or else. It's the or else that I want to make clear here. Is the president threatening to withhold aid to Israel if they do not make these changes? The president made it clear that our policies with respect to Gaza uh, will be dependent upon our assessment of how well the Israelis 
uh, make changes and implement changes uh, to, to make the situation in Gaza better for the Palestinian people. And how much time are you giving them to make these changes, to implement these concrete steps? Again, we, we would hope to see some announcements of changes here in coming hours and days, and I'll leave it at that. That's short. Hours and days. Uh, John, why today? Why today what? Why today for the phone call? Why? Why, why this apparent shift in policy today? The I think, look, uh, President, well, all of us, but particularly the president, was certainly shaken by uh, the attack on the WCK uh, convoy and, and the aid workers. As I said earlier, um, it wasn't the only event. There had been others like that, humanitarian aid uh, convoys coming under fire and losing people. Uh, and um, and the president felt strongly that it was time to, to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu about his concerns. Would you characterize this call as an ultimatum? I would characterize this call as very direct, very businesslike, uh, very professional on both sides. Um, and the president laid out his significant concerns about the direction uh, and where things are going. Um, and quite frankly, laid out as is clear in the readout um, uh, that, uh, that uh, we are willing to reconsider our own policy approaches here, um, dependent upon what the Israelis do or don't do. Can you just tell us who all was on the call? Well, it was, it was a bilateral call between the two leaders, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and the President. They were the only two speakers on the, on the call. But Vice President Harris also dialed in? Vice or? President Harris did, uh, did dial in, yes. Secretary of State, Secretary State dialed in, Jake Sullivan, yes. I don't know who was... Uh, also listening in on the Israeli side. But the but the discussion was between the two leaders. MJ. So, um, Admiral, you're not specifying what concrete steps Israel must take exactly. I, I, I gave you some uh, uh, a broad sense of it. We want to see more crossings opened up. We want to see more trucks getting in, particularly from Jordan. Um, we want to see tangible steps at the mitigation of civilian harm, uh, particularly to humanitarian aid workers, but obviously all civilians, but we want to see that they have, uh, that they have moved forward on proper steps to de-conflict with aid workers as they move around, that the information flow uh, is viable. Sure, but that's language we've heard for weeks now. You're not talking about uh, sort of telling us how exactly you will measure those measurable steps, right? What I said was we're going to we're going to e examine our policy approaches based on the, our assessment of the way the uh, Israeli side uh, modifies their behavior, uh, modifies their policy and decision-making processes. Uh, and so, first of all, let's see what they say they're going to do, and then let's watch and see how they execute to what they say. And I don't want to get ahead of them on what they, uh, on, on what they, what they plan to say about the changes they're going to make. But we'll, we'll base our policy decisions based on an assessment of how they execute to their policy decisions. And you're not talking about what potential U.S. policy changes are on the table. Can you say whether the president shared that with the prime minister on this phone call? The president made clear that, uh, that absent changes um, in the protection of civilians on the ground, absent changes to the volume of humanitarian assistance getting in, absent... Um, absent any movement on uh, a, a ceasefire that will allow uh, hostages to get out and more aid to get in, absent you know, a, a calming down, um, that he will have to reconsider his own policy choices with respect to, to Gaza. And one of the seven aid workers was obviously a dual American citizen. Did the prime minister offer the president an apology? I, I, uh, I'll let the Prime Minister speak to his side of the conversation. Uh, the, the, I would note that the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, their Southern Command commander, has made a public apology for the, the strike. And there was no mention of Rafa in this readout. Can you talk to us about how, if that did come up, and how that might have been discussed between the two? This leaders? conversation was, was focused uh, primarily on uh, the need to get a temporary ceasefire in place, the need for there to be a pause in, in the fighting um, so that we can get the hostages out, humanitarian assistance, uh, the need to see that steps are being taken to learn from this strike and to make changes in the way 
civilian harm is mitigated from an operational perspective. And they did spend time, as the readout makes clear, talking about the very public threats from, from Iran to Israel. And the President, as I said, made very clear to the Prime Minister that the United States' support for Israel's ability to defend itself from a range of threats, not just Hamas, uh, remains ironclad. Thanks, Admiral. Just a couple of things. I mean, firstly, how, how long did this call uh, last? It was about 30 minutes or so. And just going back to, I mean, just question about the, um, you know, why, why this sort of change in tone. I mean, has there been growing frustration on the part of President Biden that previous um, messaging to Prime Minister Netanyahu just doesn't seem to have gotten through? Yes, there's been growing frustration. Okay. Thank you so much, Karin. Uh, John, one question on Israel and another on Venezuela. We saw in the past President uh, Biden pushing Netanyahu to protect civilians, but how much words really matter here when on actions the same day of the attack on the humanitarian words, the U.S. was approving more bombs to Israel? Do you, we are now six months into the war. How much the U.S. actions are actually encouraging Israel to not do enough to protect civilians? Yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm kind of glad the question came up uh, because I, I would tell you when I've seen press reporting, you know, about the uh, about the uh, the arms sales and that kind of thing, and I, I would just remind you that that uh, it, with the exception of the immediate two months after the attack, we haven't really sent emergency aid and a, a military assistance to, to Israel. There was in the first couple of months, but what you're seeing here uh, is the result of a, a process of foreign military sales to Israel. That takes years. Uh, and a lot of this material that's been reported publicly was notified to Congress many, many months, if not years ago, and are in the train to get to Israel. I think it's important to remember, as I tried to mention in the last answer, that Israel still has a, a lot of threats it faces. I mean, we're all focused on Hamas, and I understand that, but uh, they still face active threats throughout the region, including from Iran. Uh, and the United States still has an ironclad commitment to help uh, Israel with its self-defense. And so a lot of these articles, including the 2,000-pound bombs and the F-35s, that's, those are things that have been long in the train and not tied. The, sale, the foreign military sales process was not tied to this conflict. Can I have yeah. one more on, on Venezuela uh, quick? Because yesterday, Nicolás Maduro enacted a law creating a uh, province of Venezuela in Guyana. And he accused the United States of building secret military bases in Esequibo. So uh, what is your reaction? And is the U.S. considering building a military base to support Guyana to defend their sovereignty? There's no plans for a secret military base. And we've said many times that, that there's an 1899 arbitral ruling about the border uh, between Guyana and Venezuela. And we want both sides to respect that ruling and to do it peacefully. Um, you said we would hope to see an announcement of changes. I'm wondering if that is just hope, or is it an expectation? Expect is it based on a commitment? We expect that th there will be uh, some, um, some announcements coming from Israel in the coming hours and days, but I want to respect their right to manage that process on their own. Okay. And um, was there any update given uh, by the Prime Minister on what exactly happened with the World Central Kitchen envoy? They, they didn't talk about the actual strike in great detail. The, the Prime Minister uh, did reiterate, um, as his military has reiterated, that this was on them, um, that the uh, investigation was, was concluding, um, that he looked forward to, to seeing it and that, you know, he would take appropriate actions to make sure something like that couldn't happen again. I mean, they, they did, obviously, they talked about it, of course. Uh, but uh, did they go through point by point the investigation's findings? No, because I think the Prime Minister's office is still evaluating um, the actual investigation results. And just to try to get a technical understanding, as you described the very long process of uh, supplying arms uh, to Israel, if this contingency isn't met and there is a change in U.S. policy, how easy or hard would it be to um, slow down or change shipments to Israel based on current law and all of the requirements and all the things you just described? Yeah, again, I don't want to get ahead of where we are. Uh, let's see 
what uh, the Israeli side does and says and what they implement and where they go before we talk about actual policy decisions. And I'm certainly not going to close down decision space for the President of the United States. He gets to make those decisions. Uh, but, I mean, obviously, as Commander in Chief, and uh, yes, the uh, foreign military sales certainly is. Uh, is supported by legislation, but uh, but there are certain authorities that you can do to manage that. But again, let's not get ahead of where we are. Uh, this is really about uh, seeing what the Israelis say they're going to do and then act on on those on those changes. Okay. And Brah, has the U.S. lost its leverage with Prime Minister Netanyahu? You, you know, I keep getting this question about leverage. Uh, Israel is an ally and a friend and a partner. Uh, and the president believes strongly and has for his entire public career in the security of the Israeli people and the, uh, and the longevity of the Israeli state. And that's not going to change. Uh, and uh, I can say unequivocally, and I don't think the prime minister would mind me saying here, that in the call today, the prime minister reiterated his thanks to President Biden and this administration for the support that, that we have continued to provide Israel. It's longstanding. It was before the 7th of October, and it is now. Uh, and that support's, uh, that support's going to continue. But again, um, with respect to Gaza, uh, we need to see certain changes. Uh, uh, and if we don't, then we'll have to consider changes to our own policy. But it's not about, it's not about leverage. It's about the relationship, and it's about the credibility I would even say the unique credibility that this particular president has in Israel and with uh, Israeli leadership based on his long public service of support. To talk about this relationship, do you think the prime minister is really listening? It was, uh, I think it was evident in the phone call today. Uh, it was uh, a, a good discussion, direct, no question, but a good discussion. And, uh, and I, I believe uh, the president made very clear his concerns, and the, the Prime Minister acknowledged those and concerns. In, in terms of the timing of this call, we understand that this call was set up after the strike on the World Central Kitchen uh, workers. Would you say that this call was a direct result of that? Was that the reason behind the call? Yes. And then one, one last thing, response to Jose Andres. Uh, Chef Andres says that the convoy was deliberately targeted. Any response from the U.S. on that? Uh, again, I, I haven't seen the Israeli investigation. Uh, they have said themselves publicly after a preliminary investigation uh, that there was no deliberate targeting of WCK and, and, and Chef Andres. Um, they, uh, they're working their way through now an independent follow-on investigation, which I understand is very, very close to complete. Um, uh, the Prime Minister just t talked about it broadly um, and uh, reiterated uh, today, the Prime Minister reiterated today, uh, that there was no deliberate targeting of, uh, of that, that aid convoy. Good night. Hi, Irene. Uh, two questions. Uh, Senator Kuhn, was very close to the President, said that we have reached a moment where uh, arms restriction to Israel should be considered. Senator Warren also said that we have, Israel has violated our own laws. Are they wrong in their assessment? The president, I think it's clear in, in the readout, Nadia, that the, the, the president has, has made it clear today uh, that if we don't see uh, changes to the way uh, the IDF is treating uh, innocent civilians and aid workers and flowing the humanitarian assistance, that uh, he's going to have to reconsider our Gaza policy. So, I mean, he was very direct with the prime minister about that. I'm not going to close down his decision space. As satisfying as that may be for some of you, I can't do that. But he made it very clear that we need to see some changes on the Israeli side. Okay, I want to ask you about a very disturbing investigative report by an Israeli journalist who said that, uh, is the White House aware of an AI program called Lavender that's been used by the Israeli army to target operative in Gaza in what they call a kill zone, where this program has only 20 seconds of human supervision. And it led to the death of thousands of women and children in Gaza. Do you think, are you aware of it, number one? And second, does the White House believe that AI can be used in this way without supervision? I, I'm not aware of it. You're going to have to let me take that question. We'll get back to you. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to start with the trilateral summit, then I'm going to move on to Rhonda. First of all, uh, looking ahead to the trilateral summit next week, what are some of the priorities? And we recently heard the Filipino ambassador say that the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines are going to start joint patrols in the South China Sea very soon. Can you confirm that and give us any details? I believe the Pentagon will have more to say about that this afternoon. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't want to get ahead of, of them on that. We're always looking for opportunities to improve 
uh, cooperation with our allies in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we're looking forward to this trilateral summit next week. I think it'll be very, very important. Uh, as you know, we have uh, 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 self-defense treaty commitments with both countries. Uh, and so the chance to sit down uh, with, uh, with both his Japanese and his Filipino counterparts is something the President's very much looking forward to. There's an awful lot to discuss. Certainly the tensions in the South China Sea are not going away. That was an issue that was raised in the president's call with President Xi just a, a couple of days ago. Uh, and so there's there's an awful lot to talk about there. Cool. Then on Rhonda, cool. I'm going to ask the most important question. Cool. I did it not think my answer was cool, but I <laughs> It's a, sorry, it's a small country, doesn't get a lot of attention, but President Biden has decided to send President Clinton Correct. to observe the 30th anniversary of the genocide. Um, you know, what message does this send to Rwandans who are understandably upset about President Clinton's lack of action when the genocide was happening? Secondly, what message is President Clinton taking to President Kagame, who's been in power since 1994 and has become increasingly authoritarian? And then finally, in 1998, President Clinton pledged the Rwandan people that his administration was going to work to identify triggers of genocidal activity so that something like this never happened again. Do you think Washington has improved on that front in the last we, 30 years? We, uh, I, I believe, I can't, I can't speak for every administration between 1998 and today, but I can tell you that uh, uh, President Biden absolutely uh, takes those responsibilities very, very seriously, particularly when it comes to genocidal threats, wherever they occur around the world. Um, and he's very grateful that President Clinton has agreed to lead the delegation for the 30th anniversary. 800,000 people slaughtered uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in that conflict. And our hearts and our prayers go out to the families of the, of the, of the survivors, uh, of those who were, who were killed. Um, just a, a, just a, a dreadful situation. And again, the president's grateful that President Clinton has agreed to, to go down there and represent the administration. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, one on uh, Israel and another on China. At this point in the conflict, does President Biden believe that a military victory against Hamas is possible for Israel? Obviously, that's going to be up to the Israeli Defense Forces and the Israeli government to determine. Well, as I've said many, many times, uh, it's difficult to eliminate an ideology with military means. But you can absolutely, through military means, um, decapitate their leadership, dry up their resources, uh, eliminate their infrastructure, their ability to, to, to operate, store weapons, uh, train troops. I mean, all of that stuff uh, can, be, uh, can be targeted with military means. But, the, the, but as I've also said, and, and you have to keep it in the context of this call, it matters how you do that. It really matters a lot how you do that. And it's the how that the president was focused on today and the, the way these operations are being prosecuted and the additional harm that's coming to uh, civilian aid workers and uh, innocent Gazans. And then Xi reportedly told President Biden during their summit in San Francisco that Beijing plans to reunify Taiwan with mainland China. Um, did the Chinese leader bring up a similar sentiment in their call the other day? And if so, what was President Biden's response? Uh, I would Certainly Taiwan came up uh, in the context of uh, of the call, there's not a single discussion that we don't have with senior leaders uh, in the PRC where we don't talk about Taiwan. Of course it came up. Um, I, I won't characterize President Xi's comments, but I can tell you that, that President Biden was very, very clear that, uh, that nothing's changed about our one China policy. We don't support independence for Taiwan, but we also don't want to see the status quo changed in a unilateral way and certainly not by force. Did, I know you said that Rafa wasn't the point of this conversation and it wasn't discussed a lot. Does that mean that that is still sort of a separate issue that's going to be sort of an ongoing discussion uh, between U.S. and Israeli officials? That, I don't know if I'd call it separate. Uh, it wasn't a focus of this call. The call was, as I answered to MJ, it was really about the humanitarian situation and changes we need to see. Um, but we look forward to having another conversation with Israeli counterparts in coming days, hopefully in a week or so, uh, on Rafah specifically. And we hope this next one will be in person, but we'll have more to say about that as we get closer to it. So uh, 
an operation in Rafah would not sort of run counter to, to these new conditions that the president laid out to, uh, to the oh, president. I didn't say that at all. I mean, one of the big concerns about a ground operation in Rafah that we've expressed is the damage it could do, uh, the, the death and destruction it could render to the 1.5 million Gazans that are seeking refuge there. So, uh, again, today's call was really focused on humanitarian assistance, civilian casualties, and that includes humanitarian aid workers. You can't talk about Rafah and the possibility of operations going after those Hamas battalions in Rafa without also talking about the humanitarian situation down there, which is dire. Yeah, Brian. Uh, thanks a lot, Admiral. Um, <laughs> does President Biden agree with Donald Trump that the Israel's war against Hamas is taking a long time? Uh, I'm not going to compare uh, the president's views to, uh, to, to Mr. Trump. I think you can understand. I need to stay out, out of that. All I would tell you is, uh, we have expressed our concerns uh, about the manner in which operations are being conducted um, and the, the speed and the energy with which we want to see changes to the way those operations are being conducted. And I think I'd leave it at that. So does, does the president think that Israel's war against Hamas is taking too long? The, the president believes that they have a right to go after the Hamas threat, which is still viable. Uh, and the president made it clear again today that we support, and we will continue to support, not just philosophically but tangibly, Israel's right to defend itself uh, against a range of threats, and certainly that includes this this fight against Hamas. But again, I want to I want to reiterate what I said earlier. It, it's not just the threat of Hamas that Israel's facing; they are facing broader threats throughout the region, including directly and publicly from from Iran. Peter, uh, John, a follow up on that first. Did the CIA warn Israel, or did President Biden warn Netanyahu today about an Iranian plan to attack inside Israel within 48 hours? I'm not going to talk about intelligence matters, Peter. I think you can understand. Um, but uh, they did talk about uh, a very public uh, and very viable, real threat by Iran to Israel's security. And I think I need to leave it at that. It's really as far as I can go. On October 7th, President Biden said, my administration's support for Israel's security is rock solid and unwavering. That is not true anymore, correct? That is, no, it is true. It's still it, true today. How is his support unwavering, but you're also reconsidering policy choices? Both can be true. They cannot be true. They're, they're completely different things. No, no, no. I just, is, I'm sorry. I, I, he I, is I, wavering. No, no, no. Come on. How is he that. not wavering? Uh, come on. <laughs> come on now. As I said, and as it says in that readout, we made clear, and, and he made it clear to the Prime Minister in his call, that our support for Israel's self-defense remains ironclad. They face a range of threats, and the United States isn't going to walk away from helping Israel defend itself. That said, you can say all that, and you can act on that, and you can believe that, and the President does, and still believe that the manner in which they are defending themselves against the Hamas threat needs to change. And that is the conversation that we had today. But both things are true. Our support is ironclad and consistent. It's not going to not going to stop. It's not going to not not going to not going to waver. But will there perhaps be some policy changes we might have to make if we don't see policy changes out of Israel? Yes. How is that unwavering? It sounds like you guys are trying to have it both ways here. No. I we don't know that Israel, I can Israel, but we are going to make all these changes because we don't support Israel. I didn't say we're going to make changes. I said we need to see well, how Israel responds to the humanitarian crises in Gaza and how they respond to the protection of aid workers. I think we can all agree. I think you would agree. You don't want to see innocent civilians killed or targeted, do you? You don't want to see uh, Gazans starve. You don't want to see famine in Gaza, Nobody do you? Wants of course to see not. That, but you're so, the policymaker and you're talking about policy changes. So, that is not what you were talking about on October 7th. Because when things it was have solid and unwavering. On October seventh, there wasn't near famine in Gaza. On October seventh, there wasn't um, a diminution of trucks getting into Gaza. On October seventh, we didn't see thousands and thousands of innocent people killed. I mean, I could go on and on. The, it, we're talking about a conflict there, which is dang near at six months here this weekend, six months. And it has changed over time. And 
the, what the president's message today was, we need to see some changes in the way Israel is dealing with that threat. And that's that's what two good friends and allies can discuss. This isn't about un, this isn't about changing our support to Israel or the security of the Israeli state. And I, I just have to take issue with the premise of the question. Okay, just the last one then. Where is President Biden on any of this? When he wants to talk about how angry he is or frustrated he is about the high cost of insulin, he comes out and gives an impassioned speech. Where is he on any of this? He's been talking about this. He's been issuing statements on this. In uh, private? Uh, no. That, that statement, the last I looked, was public. Right? But where is he? Why isn't he here right now? I'm sure you'll continue to hear from the president about this and many other national security issues. Right, we got we to wrap it up. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, can you share any, anything about um, White House views on upcoming UN Security Council resolution to prohibit nu nuclear weapons in space, which is scheduled to vote as soon as we can? Uh, yeah, actually I can, and if you don't mind, I'm, I do have some notes. I want to make sure that I get this right. Uh, but I think last month, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield announced that the United States and Japan would put forward a Security Council resolution calling on all countries not to deploy nuclear weapons in space or to develop nuclear weapons specifically designed to be placed in orbit around the Earth. And we will be bringing this resolution to a vote in New York early next week. Now, the vote should be straightforward. The Outer Space Treaty, which has been signed by more than 130 countries, including Russia, the PRC, and, of course, the United States, prohibits the deployment of, quote, nuclear weapons or other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, end quote, in orbit, period. And we have heard President Putin say that Russia has no intention of deploying nuclear weapons in space. So we look forward to Russia voting in favor of this resolution. There should be no reason why not to. And if they do, then I think that should open up some really legitimate questions to Mr. Putin about what his intentions really are. SV, you have a last question. Uh, Admiral, could you clarify on the, the, the ceasefire language that uh, the President used in the statement? He says that, he under, uh, that there should be a ceasefire. Um, and then the next, after a comma, it's he urged Prime Minister and power negotiators to conclude a deal without delay. So are the two tied together, or is he saying ceasefire right now, and then the other thing later? I mean, what? We, how we, immediate is immediate? I, I can't really improve upon the president's language. We don't, we want to see a pause in the fighting. We want to see a ceasefire uh, immediately, um, so that uh, we can uh, get more humanitarian assistance in and create a, a set of conditions where aid organizations feel better about operating inside Gaza, because as we've, we've already seen it in, in, as a result of the attack on the WCK uh, workers that some aid organizations now are pulling back. So we want to see that immediate ceasefire in place. We also, of course, as we've said many times, um, think that that could also provide a window here to get the hostages out. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Admiral. Admiral. Was it an ultimatum? Was it an ultimatum? All right, thank you so much, Admiral. Before, uh, before the call or after the call, has the White House briefed lawmakers on Capitol Hill about this potential change uh, in U.S. policy? What is at stake here? Well, look, um, I think the Admiral made it very clear. Uh, we are uh, giving the Israeli government an opportunity to deal with something that is pretty serious, humanitarian aid workers who are, you know, who are, we saw this week, being killed. I think we talked about, uh, we've seen that more than 200 humanitarian aid workers in the past several months. Uh, and so that needs to stop. And so we're giving the Israeli government, as you heard from my colleague, come up with some, uh, some ways, some, you know, some measures here uh, on how to avoid that. We have to keep uh, civilians, uh, civilians safe. We have to keep humanitarian workers safe. And so I don't want to get ahead of that. We're always having conversations, always in contact with congressional members. I don't have a readout of um, outreach that was done right after the call. Obviously, the call ended not too long ago, uh, and so don't want to, to get ahead of that. But I think in that readout, the president made it very clear where he stand, where he st where he stands in this moment. He made it very clear after the horrific, um, you know, the, what happened, to the horrific events of seven uh, seven, you know, brave people doing doing heroic work. What happened to them? He put out a very strong statement. So I think the president has been very clear. He's outraged. He's heartbroken, and this needs to stop. We need to protect civilian lives. That's why he's having. Uh, that's why his team is having conversation 
conversations with the Israeli government on Rafah operations and what that's going to look like. They're having a, a you know reasonable debate back and forth and, and, and talking about that. We're hoping, we, are, we expect uh, that to happen in person very shortly. Uh, and so the president has been very clear. We got to protect civilian lives. We have to protect humanitarian aid workers. Uh, and, uh, and those conversations certainly are going to continue. You had a question yesterday whether the president's con uh, conversation with the doctor who had been in Gaza uh, on Tuesday was his first interaction with somebody who had been on the ground uh, in Gaza since the war uh, began. I was hoping he might have a uh, you have to give us an answer on that. So a couple of things. Uh, I did uh, have a, uh, a moment to look into that. And so, as you know, the president and his senior team have been pretty actively honoring their commitment uh, he made on in continuing that ongoing engagement uh, with communities directly, obviously impacted uh, by the conflict in Gaza. And he did that by hosting community leaders just this week. But also, you've seen the senior White House officials uh, going to Michigan, going to Illinois, and continuing those conversations uh, over the past several months. Uh, so um, look, and we believe and that by going across the country and hearing directly from community leaders in numerous states that we are doing, we are keeping that ongoing commitment. Uh, and so, look, the three doctors, there were three doctors who uh, recently returned from Gaza who participated in the meeting uh, this week, and they shared their firsthand experience with President Biden. And so we can say that there were three doctors. We're trying to be really respectful uh, and keeping the privacy of those who are attending these very private meetings. But we were able to share, I am able to share, there were at least three doctors who have, uh, who have had um, the firsthand experience have gone to Gaza, and they were able uh, to share uh, to share their firsthand experience with the president. And so I can share that, but I also want to be really careful because we do want to keep our commitment in keeping these conversations private, and that includes the, atten the attendees. So that was the first time that the president has interacted with anybody who'd been on the ground. Correct? So what I can say is, uh, didn't go. I have not checked in on on that. Right. I want to be I'm really careful. No, no. But I think three doctors coming to the meeting the other day yesterday and laying out uh, their first account, I think that's important, right? So we were able to share that information with you. Three doctors who were, who've been in Gaza and it were shared directly with the president what they have seen on the ground. That matters, right? It's so, uh, want to be very clear about that. Look, we are going to continue to keep our commitment in hearing from uh, folks in the communities who have been directly affected by this. That's been our commitment from very early on. Uh, we understand how painful this is for many. Uh, we understand how important uh, it is to hear directly uh, from Americans. This is what the president wants to do. He's a president for all Americans. He has said that continuously on any issue. And on this issue, it is important to do that as well. And then uh, yesterday you got a question that the president been briefed on uh this uh, avian flu outbreak. Um, wondering, has, is the president going to designate any sort of coordinator at the White House or the federal yeah. government to manage this? So response? I'm glad that you asked that question because we do have a, a, a couple of things to share with all of you. The president has been briefed. I think I may have shared that yesterday as well. Uh, look, the health and safety of American public is very serious. We take that very seriously. Uh, our top priority, obviously, is to keep communities healthy, safe, and informed. What we were able to do uh, is uh, the White House immediately, the White House stood up a response team with relevant agencies like the CDC, FDA, USDA to ensure that we are doing everything in our power to ensure we keep communities healthy, safe, and informed, ensure that our nation's food supply remains safe, and monitor any and all trends to mitigate risk and prevent the spread of avian flu. We are also in regular touch with those relevant agencies uh, and receiving daily updates because, again, we take that very seriously. And this is an issue when you think about the avian flu. This is public experts, health experts, and agencies. Uh, have been preparing for this for decades, for 20 years now. And so we have invested the ability to test, the ability to prevent and to treat. And so as CDC said themselves, right now the risk to human health uh, from this outbreak is low, but we want to keep it that way, which is why we set up uh, this, uh, uh, this immediate response team. And so we're going to monitor, continue to monitor, uh, and, uh, and we're going to look for all rele relevant trends as it relates to the avian flu, uh, and we want to make sure that we keep all Americans safe. Thank you for the question. I think it's important. Go ahead, MJ. Um, Kareen, if uh, Speaker Johnson were to put some form of uh, Ukraine aid on the floor and a lawmaker, say a congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, then moves to oust him, would the White House, would the president uh, support Democrats working to keep him as Speaker? So we've always been very 
very, very careful when it comes to leadership. Uh, and we have always said, when it comes to picking the speaker, picking the leader uh, in the Senate, we want to let Congress deal with that. We want, in this case, it's something that House Republicans have to decide on. That's something that uh, that uh, uh, Leader Jeffries and his caucus have to decide on. We are not going to weigh in on that. We've been very consistent over the past three years, and we stand by that. Any recent contact with the Speaker's office? That you can read I don't have anything to read out to you at this time. Obviously, our Office of Ledge Affairs is in constant communication with congressional members uh, on the Hill. And I do want to just say, and we've been pretty consistent about this when it comes to the National Security Supplemental, that it you, in, includes all important Ukrainian uh, aid. We believe that there's bipartisan, there continues to be bipartisan support uh, in, in Congress. The Speaker needs to put that on the floor. He needs to make sure that, uh, that he gives House members an opportunity to vote for that. We believe it would get overwhelming support. And we have to remember Remember, there are lives at stake. There are lives at stake here in, in Ukraine. The brave people of Ukraine need the assistance from the U.S. to continue to fight for their democracy. That's what we've been able to do for more than two years. We've got to continue that. And because of congressional inaction, we have sadly have seen um, their, you know, their, them, Ukrainians, losing ground in the battlefield. And so we believe put it out on the floor, the speaker needs to do that, let the congressional members uh, vote on it. We think it'll get overwhelming support, 7229 coming out of the Senate for that national security supplemental. It got to move. It has to move. Lives are at stake here. Okay. Green, was the president briefed yesterday or did he see the comments by Jose Andres in his interview with Reuters? He's aware. He's aware. He's been, he's been briefed and he's aware by the comments. Look, um, you saw the president. We, we put that in, the, in his statement. Obviously, he, we made sure that it was in his statement uh, how he felt uh, about his relationship, his friendship, friendship with uh, Chef, uh, Chef Andres. Uh, they, he considers him a friend. Uh, he sees him as a hero uh, in everything that he has done, not just in Gaza, but across uh, the globe in feeding, uh, in feeding people who are in need, the humanitarian assistance that he provides. Uh, we have said the the op-ed that he wrote is incredibly powerful. Uh, and uh, he, you know, that the first couple of words out of his statement yesterday was outrage and heartbroken. Seven people died. Outrage and heart heartbroken. Is he concerned about the discrepancy, though, between how Chef Andres described a deliberate attack on his workers versus what the White House yeah. and Israel have said in terms of describing that attack? Look, there's an investigation, ongoing investigation. We're going to let that investigation move forward. Uh, and we certainly, uh, I think we all can understand how heartbroken uh, Chef Jose Andres is at this moment. Uh, we understand that. We are mourning with him. We are mourning uh, with the families that lost their loved ones. So we can be sensitive to that. Uh, but as it relates to making any declarative statement, we have to make sure that this investigation moves forward. And it is. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see where that takes us. Okay, Nancy. Uh, thanks, Corrine. Uh, the presidents of the parents, rather, of Jacob Flickinger, who's the American citizen who was uh, killed in the World Central Kitchen strike, uh, they said this morning they haven't heard from anyone in the U.S. government except for um, that first day when they got a notification from the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. Does the president or anyone else at the White House plan to reach out to them? So uh, don't have a, a readout uh, for you at this time. Look, um, we've been always very clear about this, that our hearts, and I just said this to uh, Jeff, our hearts go out to the families. It is tragic, tragic. We send our deepest, deepest condolences, uh, obviously, uh, to the family of Jacob. And, um, you know, he and the world uh, World Central, Central Kitchen workers were doing heroic work, as I just mentioned. And uh, what happened, what happened on the ground as they were doing that heroic work in Gaza is tragic, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking. And uh, um, we just don't have any additional calls to read out right now. Uh, I expect members of the administration uh, to be in touch with the, with the family uh, to express our, our condolences directly. I uh, just don't have any, anything to read out at this time. But obviously, our hearts go out uh, to all the families who lost, who lost, who lost someone they loved. Um, and several Democrats are now calling for an independent investigation into what happened here. Is the White House open to changing its position on this? We're going to um, let Israeli, uh, the Israeli government uh, do their investigation and see where that takes us. I don't want to get ahead of that. 
they're doing an investigation. We have said we want it to be comprehensive. We want it to be uh, make sure there it that uh, it has accountability. We want it to be swift, obviously, and we want it to be public. So don't want to get ahead of that. Let that process move <laughs> forward, and uh, we'll see where we are from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Grady. So yesterday, John Kirby said that um, the U.S. would not consider a, a shift in. Um, their policy towards Israel until they finished their review of the World Central Kitchen strike. And just now, um, he said that the U.S. may consider a change if they don't make changes in Gaza within hours and days. So where is that, where is that shift coming from? I think it's, we're talking about that, the conversation that happened today uh, with the president, as we have said, it was very direct, it was productive, it was professional, 30-minute conversation, and it was based on humanitarian uh, aid, protecting aid workers, which is really important, protecting civilians, and that's what the conversation was primarily about. And what we have said, it's in the readout, that we want to see measurable changes to protect those aid workers, to protect uh, civilian lives. And so that is what is he was talking about. That's what he, the president laid out in, in uh, the statement that we put out. You heard that from Secretary <laughs> Lincoln today. And I think that's uh, the way that we want to make sure that uh, we're, you know, we want to be very clear about that. We want to see measurable changes to how humanitarian aids workers are protected. That's what the conversation was about. And that's the changes that we want to see uh, the Israeli government present. That's what he was talking about in the days uh, to come. And if I could just get one more. Um, sure. Yesterday, uh, Benny Gantz, the Israeli war cabinet uh, minister, called for Israel to hold early elections by September. Uh, where does the White House stand we're not gonna. We're not going to get involved in um, the Israeli government or any government's uh, elections. That is something for them to decide on. It's not coming from here. Question about electric vehicles. Um, Ford said today it's delaying production on an electric SUV. Tesla earlier this week said that its sales are plunging. Do these types of developments make the administration rethink their EV policy? No, not at all. Look, um, you know, when it comes to EV sales, they are reaching record highs. Uh, EVs are more affordable than ever, and that's because of the work that this administration has done. Uh, last year, EV sales surpassed 1 million for the first time ever. That's a 50% increase. That matters. Under President Biden, EV sales have more than quadrupled. Sales of hybrids and EVs are now a record high of 18% of all light-duty vehicle sales. Average price of an EV is down 20% from just a year ago, just one year ago. So we believe that this is part of, well, I should say, the president has always said that he wants to make sure we do everything that we can to lower cost, lower prices. This is part of that. And also do all, everything that we can to deal with uh, a climate crisis. And this is part of that. So is it realistic to go from about 7 or 8% of sales to 50% of sales in eight <coughs> years if the automakers themselves are cutting back on production? We believe, and we've seen that, that U.S. Manufa US manufacturing jobs have increased. Jobs have indeed increased. Uh, and when you see a boom like this, that means you need auto workers, right? It can't happen on its own. Uh, and so we, uh, we believe this is working. We believe this is part of uh, what the president has promised. Uh, and uh, we want to see a manufacturing uh, industry that's for the future of this, of this country. And that's what we're seeing. And that's what the president's wor working and, towards. Uh, question about yesterday's call with President Xi. If President Biden is concerned enough about TikTok to bring it up on a call with the president of China, why is he and why is the vice president why are they still making videos for TikTok? Uh, that's coming out of the campaign, so I would refer you to the campaign. Wait, wait, that's, I understand. It is the campaign's decision. I would refer you to the campaign. We have been very clear. We are not trying to ban TikTok. We're not trying to ban TikTok. We're talking about a divestment. You heard that from the National Security Advisor when he's been here a couple times at the podium speaking to uh, TikTok and the legislation and how we're trying to move forward. It is a, it is a, a platform uh, that we really need to take seriously here. Uh, we're talking about on national security. And so we've talked about not banning, divesting. Not banning, divesting. So we want to be very clear about that. Go ahead, Karen. Um, there's a report from Bloomberg that the White House, specifically Jeff Zients and Will Brainerd, are calling um, major Baltimore employers, including Amazon and Home Depot, encouraging them to not cut jobs in the wake of the bridge collapse. Um, can you con 
confirm that that outreach is happening and other outreach like that, and what is the message from the administration to those big companies? So a couple of things that, uh, uh, and I think I've read this out before, that we have been doing as it relates to su supply chain and the potential economic impact. <laughs> Uh, the President's Supply Chain Dis Distribution Task Force has convened multiple times at this point uh, to analyze the impact of supply chain, which has so far been manageable, which is important. The task force worked with railroads to set up new service lines and with ports and ocean carriers to divert vessels. Uh, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, has made low interest disaster loan assistance available to eligible businesses and set up business recovery centers to help on the ground as it relates to your question about Chief, the Chief, Chief of Staff Zines and other senior uh, White House officials. Uh, they have had, uh, they have called uh, major employers in the Baltimore area, including retail chains and distributors, to encourage them to retain workers. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we we're having those important conversations for the people of Baltimore, obviously. <laughs> They're also working with SBA to reach out to small businesses and are in touch with local unions alongside the Labor Department as well. So we're going to do everything we can uh, to have these conversations with stakeholders uh, so that we can identify any uh, and address any potential disruptions. Uh, and so we, if anything, this should show that this is an administration that's being active and we're being um, uh, proactive, obviously. Uh, in trying to make sure that uh, that uh, we deal with any potential economic impact. Right now, as I said at the top, we see this being manageable, uh, and this is why the, these um, these conversations are critical with stakeholders and at this time. Do you have any update tomorrow for state and local officials about Congress moving forward on the funding package? So I'm not going to get ahead of the, of the president. Uh, he, as you know, he's going to be there on the ground. Uh, we'll certainly have more to share later tonight. I, as I mentioned at the top, he's going to have a an opportunity uh, to engage with uh, family members. Uh, we lost, as you know, uh, uh, we lost lives uh, on that night. Uh, and uh, the president, as he does, and he understands what it means for people to have loss, he'll be there for those families, uh, just like he'll certainly be there for the people of Baltimore. Okay. Thanks, Craig. I have a question about the state dinner next week. <laughs> <laughs> But I saw the White House announce today the dinner itself is going to be held in the East Room. And I was just curious, the last state dinner was held on a tent on the South Lawn? Yeah. Was the East Room chosen out of concern that protesters who have been coming no. out of the president might be shouting out no, the South Lawn? And not at all. We've, we've, it's, not the, it's not the first um, state dinner that's been held in the East Room. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, South Korea was held in the East Room. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't read too much into it. Okay. I'm going to take one more. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very I much. <laughs> I appreciate you. Calling I have me. thoughts, but I want to keep my thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, no, no. I, I, I appreciate you are correct. It's been a while, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about press freedom and then about a significant White House personnel matter. Um, about press freedom, our yeah. government appears to be closer to potentially extraditing Julian Assange. Um, press freedom groups say that the case threatens to criminalize our profession. So I'm wondering what the White House's thinking is uh, regarding that matter and the potential for threat to press freedom. Does the White House have a stance on the pending federal press shield legislation to pass the House and that Senator Schumer told me he hopes reaches President Biden's desk this year? You're talking about the Press Act more specifically? Yes. Look, and I said this, I've said this many times, I said this last week, where journalism is not a crime. We've been very clear about that. Uh, and uh, as it relates to this particular legislation, uh, I haven't reviewed it. Would have to talk to our, our Office of Ledge Affairs on that particular legislation. But I do want to say, back in October of 2022, the Justice Department codified a policy to ban subpoenas of journalist uh, records. Uh, the president strongly supports the right of free and independent press. That is something that the president <laughs> talked about when he was at the gridiron. Uh, the president talked about this at the last White House uh, correspondence. Respondents Dinner, he's been very consistent uh, about this. And I'll just quote him for a second. A free press is a pillar of any free society. And while we may not always agree with certain coverage or admire it, we do admire the courage of the free press. Journalism, again, is not a crime. Before moving on, just to confirm, no stance yet on the Press Act that you're aware of. And the Assange matter is their concern about 
that. Uh, you know, I, I don't have much more to share besides what I just laid out here, um, so I'll just leave it as uh, what I just stated to you. In prison and five years. I understand. I, I, hear, I, hear, I heard the question. I'm just not going to go beyond from what I just stated. And on the personal matter, I'd like to ask you about my reporting on Anthony Bernal, who is one of the most powerful figures in this White House. Uh, the First Lady reportedly refers to him as her work husband. Uh, three former colleagues have made allegations of sexual harassment against him, building on prior reports of bullying. Uh, some of these sources have worked with you. I, I think you'd find them credible. Uh, but Chief of Staff Zients issued a statement dismissing the allegations as unfounded attacks without even investigating them, which uh, my sources say they're alarmed about because they say it could chill sexual harassment and bullying reports. Um, how can the White House potentially or possibly justify not investigate, investigate these allegations when the president says he will fire So a couple of things. I don't know who your sources are, so I, I can't, I, just with all due respect, I can't speak to that, right? I, I just don't. I mean, they're blind sources. I can't speak to that. Um, what I can speak to is you saw a statement from uh, our chief of staff, Jeffrey Zients, saying they are unfounded. Uh, you saw a very strong statement from Anthony uh, himself. It was in your, obviously, in your reporting, uh, and he said the same. And uh, I cannot speak to personnel investigations here or anything like that. That is not something I will ever speak to. Uh, and I'm not saying there is one. I'm just saying that I will never, sp I cannot speak to that, and that's not something I can do. Uh, but hold on. Um, I have known Anthony for some time now. I've known him for more than a decade. I've worked closely with him, uh, and I consider him a friend, but also a colleague that I respect. And that's basically what you also heard uh, from uh, Jeffrey Zines. I just don't have anything else to share beyond your reporting. I, I, I'm, I, I just got a question on this, no, because the president no, said I, he would I fire people for disrespecting colleagues, so there's no wait, investigation. I just, laid, I just said to you that they have said themselves, Jeffrey Zines and also Anthony Bernal, that they are unfounded. I can't speak to your sources. Those are your sources to speak to. I cannot. Does but no. Special status come from I, the first lady shielding Steve, him as some Steven, sources. I've, I've answered the question. I've answered the question. Bernard, Anthony Bernal spoke for himself. You heard from our chief of staff, our chief of staff, and gave your uh, publication a statement, obviously. And you've heard from me. I, I'm. I don't have it. I don't. I don't have anything else to share. Say, I don't have anything else to share on that. Uh, with, so we don't end in that way. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Uh, uh, I guess I wanted to just clean up something that you've uh, spoken to today. Would you care, categorize the, the conversation with Netanyahu that we've been told about all day long? Was it an ultimatum? Did we deliver an ultimatum? No, uh, I mean, look, was it a shot across wait, the bow? It was, it was a direct conversation. It was an honest conversation. Uh, it lasted 30 minutes, have you heard from my colleague? And we have said this many times before, you've heard this from us, you've heard this from the, the president himself. Uh, the prime minister and this president have known, them, known each other for decades, and because they have known each other for some time, uh, they have been able to have a direct and honest conversation. And so after what we saw, uh, especially uh, with seven, you know, seven lives taken the, from the who were part of the World Central Kitchen workers, right? Uh, who were doing heroic heroic acts, providing humanitarian aid. Uh, you know, after what we saw, and you heard from the president, he was outraged. He was outraged. Uh, he was heartbroken. He wanted to have this direct conversation on how to keep humanitarian aid workers safe, and protected, and also civilians, innocent civilians. And that conversation has been happening for some time. Uh, and so on, on protecting innocent civilian lives. I mean, that's one of the reasons, as I stated moments ago, why he wanted to get, make sure that his team and the prime minister's team came together to talk about uh, their RAFA, potential RAFA operations, because he believes that we need to protect civilian lives and a major uh, major uh, military operation was not the way to go, understanding that there, there are Hamas operatives in Rafa, but we have to make sure that we protect innocent lives here. So they had a very direct conversation uh, that is, uh, that is uh, because they've known each other for many decades. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. Hopefully we'll see some of you in Baltimore tomorrow.